All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this Mountaineers Books web event. I'm Marissa Lytak, and today's presentation is Hiking Oregon, Mount Hood and Oregon's Ancient Forests with guidebook authors Eli Bachetto and Chandra Legui. Eli is the author of three Mountaineers Books Oregon hiking guides, Day Hiking Mount Hood, which we'll be getting an inside look at today, in addition to Hiking the Pacific Crest Trail Oregon and Urban Trails Portland. Eli is also the founder of PCT Oregon and serves on the advisory council of the Oregon Trails Coalition. Chandra is the Western Oregon Field Coordinator for Oregon Wild, a nonprofit whose mission is to protect and restore Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. She is also the author of Oregon's Ancient Forests, a hiking guide, which was published by Mountaineers Books in partnership with Oregon Wild. Tonight's presentation will last about 50 minutes and be followed with questions and answers. You can ask a question anytime during the presentation by using the question box that you can see on your screen. We'll save your questions for our speakers to answer after they have finished presenting. So let's get started. Eli, I am handing the reins over to you. Hi there, everyone, and thanks, Marissa, for that introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our program tonight. Hope you all are doing well and being safe out there. Uh, tonight, I'm excited to introduce you to the brand new book that I finished uh, recently, Day Hiking Mount Hood. Um, we're going to be taking an inside look at uh, this uh, new guidebook, which um, not only covers a lot of Mount Hood's popular trails, as well as some more obscure ones that you might not be familiar with, but it also takes a seasonal look at hiking on Mount Hood so that it gives you opportunities to explore the mountain at any time of the year. Um, uh, this was a particular challenge uh, with uh, a lot of the events that we've had lately, uh, like wildfires and, uh, and other things. Um, and uh, it would be my preference to be broadcasting this from the trail, but we're in strange times right now. So um, you all get to uh, uh, enjoy this from my kitchen. So um, with that, we're going to uh, dive right into it. And I'm gonna give a few highlights from the book, and then we're gonna talk about some hiking, as well as how to get, there, get out there and uh, recreate responsibly this year, considering the current uh, health concerns that are going around. So, um, one of my favorite features in this new guidebook is the table that starts the book called Hikes at a Glance. This gives you a rundown of all the trails that are in the book and their, and their seasonal appeal for when you might want to get out and hike some of these things, like summer wildflower hikes or fall color hikes. There's even trails in there to hike in the snow during the wintertime. Um, it also gives tips on dog and kid-friendly hikes, um, as well as where you can go for great views, historical points of interest, and even suggestions for trails that are good on cloudy days. Unfortunately, in light of the situation that we're in right now, it does not give you suggestions for where to recreate responsibly and practice safe social distancing uh, so that you can avoid some of the crowds that uh, are typical to congregate on a lot of Mount Hood's more popular trails. And so that's what's gonna be the focus of our uh, conversation tonight because I've gone and picked out 10 trails that you might want to consider to help you practice some of that physical distancing this summer and avoid those most crowded spots. Um, before we dive into that though, um, I'd like to talk briefly about the Recreate Responsibly uh, Coalition. Um, uh, myself and my, um, my brand, PCT Oregon, we're a member of this coalition to promote safe hiking this summer. And we can do that by practicing six general guidelines. Um, you can see them on uh, the screen right now. And you can get for more information on these if you go to the recreateresponsibly.org uh, website. But to break them down real quick and simply, um, you wanna know what's going on where you're going. 
um, because not all facilities are going to be open uh, for some time. Uh, fortunately for us, Mount Hood National Forest is reopening most of their recreation sites tomorrow um, for day use, although for day use only. Um, that includes trails, picnic areas, campgrounds, however, are going to remain closed for the indefinite future. They're going to wait and see what happens. Um, other things that we should get used to being closed out there are restrooms, ranger stations, and other visitor facilities. Uh, this means that uh, you want to have your pass in hand before you head up there because the ranger station might not be open to give you one. Um, you should also plan on planning ahead. Um, given a lot of those closures, you want to make sure you have enough uh, food, pack your lunch, have water because uh, essentials and supplies might not be available up on the mountain when you're ready to get up and get out there. Um, they're recommending that we stay close to home, that we don't travel too far. This reduces traffic on the roads and uh, in case of uh, uh, incidents, you're not far away from where you need to be. Um, of course, that physical distancing thing, that's a key point this summer that everybody will be practicing. Um, when you're in areas, which are inevitable, even with some of the trails we'll be talking about tonight, you'll be in close proximity to other hikers. It's a good idea to try to maintain that physical distancing. Um, at least six feet if you're standing, at least 12 feet if you're in motion. Um, and it's always a good idea to have a face covering or mask with you in your, when you're in those more crowded areas. Of course, when you leave the crowds behind and you get on those remote trails and away from everyone, it's uh, fine to take your mask off and enjoy the fresh air, but you just want to practice that safety both for yourself and for others when you're in those uh, more populated areas. Another recommendation is to play it safe out there. Uh, don't engage in any risky activities uh, such as uh, going off trail or any uh, dicey um, adventures because both search and rescue and health uh, oper healthcare operations are stretched really thin right now. So uh, there might not be service available at any given time if you were to get injured out there. So it's a good idea to take it easy enjoy those known trails and just play it safe. And finally, and uh, this is always a given, but we just like to reinforce this, that we need to leave no trace. Um, everything that we take out there, we should be taking back with us. Um, even if there is a trash can at a trailhead, it might not be available or it might not be getting serviced regularly. These can quickly over overflow and uh, turn into giant garbage piles at trailheads. So, we should do our due diligence to just take everything that we, uh, every bit of trash that we generate with us back home and dispose of it there. Okay, that being said, let's dive into some trails tonight. So the approach that I'm gonna take tonight in covering these trail selections is kind of a hike here, not there. And that'll be generally to avoid some of those crowded situations like I mentioned. So, um, I'll uh, give some suggestions for trails that you might want to avoid. Uh, for right now, of course, you know, once this uh, situation blows over, then we can all flock back to those because they are so awesome and we love hiking them. But right now, we probably want to just save those for later and take this opportunity to try some more obscure trails and lesser traveled ones so that we can exercise that distancing and stay safe out there. So the ones that I would... Uh, avoid the big view hikes. These are the ones that we all love, getting up high, seeing the big mountain in front of us. Um, but trails that we want to avoid right now include Lookout Mountain, Bald Mountain, Mirror Lake, McNeil Point, some of these really popular trails that people tend to congregate, and uh, go for a different point of view. And for that, uh, one of my big recommendations is Hayu Mountain. I'll bet a lot of you haven't even heard of this one and you're wondering where it is. It's actually right near Lolo Pass, and it's a nice, nice walk along the Pacific Crest Trail heading northbound. It's got a few nice viewpoints, and then it dives into really nice, rich, old-growth forest that's just full of fern and berries and vanilla leaf for a nice walk through the woods. Um, you can uh, go as far as the Huckleberry Mountain Trail, which makes a nice uh, eight-mile round trip, or go as far as Buck Peak with another great view for a full day around 14 uh, miles out and back. Um, 
So that's a great one to try if you've never ventured into that area. This doesn't see a lot of people except for the occasional uh, PCT through hiker that's racing to get to Cascade Locks and get a cold drink and something to eat. Another good one is Bonnie Butte. Uh, this one is located south of Mount Hood um, uh, in the Badger Creek Wilderness area. Um, this is a good one to get away from those big crowds. Um, it's a nice trail through the woods that goes up to the top of a big butte with bigger views of Mount Hood. The cool thing about this one is in fall, um, Hawkwatch International volunteers camp out on the mountain to, mo to monitor raptor migrations. They're really friendly. They offer clinics and demonstrations of uh, how they tag birds, and there's great views up there. There's an extra alternate to take a trip around the Bonnie Meadows Loop, um, and another good way to get away from big crowds. And finally, uh, this is a hike that I squeezed into the book at the very last minute because it was just reopened and recommissioned by the Forest Service. Um, and this is Owl Point, and it's on the lower Old Vista Ridge Trail on the north side of the mountain. You can get to it via the Lolo Pass Road, either from uh, Lolo Pass uh, coming in from um, the Rhododendron area or coming up from the Hood River and uh, Lost Lake Road area. But um, once uh, Trail Keepers of Oregon got in there and cleared out all the blowdown from the lower portion of this trail, they made a couple of really great viewpoints accessible again. Um, it takes a long road to get back there, which uh, a lot of the people looking for quick and easy access tend to avoid. And so this is a good one to really get away from those crowds and get out into the middle of nowhere and get some really nice views, as you can see here. Now, of course, summertime on the mountain, you know, it starts heating up out there. Everybody wants to go where there's water, um, but um, unfortunately, water is a giant people magnet. And this summer, since we're looking at avoiding those uh, giant people magnet locations, um, such as Ramona Falls, Tamuanas Falls, Burnt Lake, Mirror Lake, etc., cetera, um, there are some alternate options for going to where the water is, where you can avoid those crowds if you're willing to put in a little extra effort for it. Of course, that effort pays off because these aren't super popular hiking trails that a lot of people flock to. The first one is being Cast Lake. Um, this is high up in the Zigzag Mountain area. You can reach this from the Sandy River Trails area um, where everybody's flocking to Ramona Falls. Instead, you can veer off to a horse camp and find this little trailhead hidden back uh, behind the campground. It's a long climb to get up to the ridge and then drop down to the lake, but it makes a really picturesque spot to go for picnics. And um, when they uh, decide to open up the wilderness to overnight use again, it makes a great spot for a quick and easy uh, overnight backpack. Another one is uh, Timothy Lake. Um, you might be thinking, whoa, wait a minute, Timothy Lake is packed all the time. And if you head for the South Shore area where all the parking lots and campgrounds are, that is very true. However, there's also a back door to the Timothy Lake, um, and that's via the Little Crater Lake Campground. Uh, this is north of the lake. There's a small trailhead up there, and it grants you access to the PCT and either side of the lake trails, be that the Timothy Lake Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, once you get past the little Crater Lake viewpoint where crowds tend to gather a little bit, so wear your mask to get through there. But then once you get onto the PCT and head for the lake, you can hike down either side of the lake uh, pretty much crowd free and get away from all of those people. Of course, if you're gonna do the entire loop, make sure you have your mask handy to go through that South Shore area with all those beaches and campgrounds because uh, despite um, the, uh, the advisories, I mean, there's still going to probably be crowds this summer and you'll wanna stay safe when passing through those areas. And uh, finally, it doesn't look like there's much water in this particular picture, but if you look um, kind of up towards the uh, upper right corner directly below the highest peak on Mount Hood there, you might be able to see what looks like a little tiny stream of water going over a little little hillside there. Um, 
Well, that is actually a pretty significant waterfall up at the head of Heather Canyon. And uh, this is a fantastic hike for getting away from crowds because uh, most of them are all flocking towards uh, Elk Meadows or Umbrella Falls. But if you climb up above those areas, uh, you can connect with the Timberline Trail and then you can take a really nice traverse through the head of Heather Canyon, which is more known for some really awesome backcountry skiing, but the trail also winds, the Timberline Trail also winds through that area and offers some fantastic hiking in summertime with great views and uh, not a lot of people venture into that area. So this is where you might find a little bit of solitude, get away from a lot of people. And then, um, Finally, I wanted to give a few suggestions on where you might be able to just avoid crowds in general by going to some more rem remote locations and uh, skipping the, the busy and known locations uh, completely. Again, that would include places like Elk Meadow, Cooper Spur, McNeil Point, um, et cetera. And uh, my first recommendation is Paradise Park. Now, and this is another one you're probably thinking, Paradise Park is insane crowded during the summertime. And that is true if you take it from the more popular approach via the Timberline Lodge trailhead and you just hike along the Timberline Trail all the way to Paradise Park. But there's a much lesser used trail, the actual Paradise Park Trail, which originates on the Kiwanis Camp Road, which is southwest of Government Camp, down at the bottom of the mountain. Now, bottom of the mountain, that means you're climbing all the way up the mountain to Paradise Park. So yes, it's a big climb, but it's a lot lesser used trail. And uh, the good news is, is there was a giant blowdown uh, episode on that trail a couple of years ago. Microburst just leveled about a quarter square mile of forest up there, but uh, the Forest Service and other trail crews got in there and cleaned that right up and it reopened at the end of last season and so that trail is passable again and that leads straight up into the Paradise Park area and once you're in the Paradise Park area there is plenty of room to spread out on that trail and up in those upper basins so you can get away from the crowds even if you happen to see uh, a higher number of uh, people out in that area. Um, another one is uh, over on the other side of the mountain, on the east side is Palali Ridge. This one is in the Cooper Spur Ski Area and is more known as a ski trail than a hiking trail, but it's a nice ridge hike um, that offers some fantastic views of not only Mount Hood, but a lot of the Washington Cascade Peaks as well. Now this one is for the root finders and the bushwhackers because uh, this trail does not get a lot of maintenance. Um, you have to go up through a lot of chinkapin and, uh, and other shrubbery to find the trail, but the views make it worth it. And uh, because of this one's more difficult nature, uh, not a lot of crowds head for this particular area. Um, let's see, getting down to the bottom of our list, uh, Elk Cove on the north side of Mount Hood is a fantastic meadow and wildflower garden area to visit. This trailhead originates in the Lawrence Lake area. Um, and it's a big climb along a big exposed ridge, but you get into these wide basins and uh, where there's just not a lot of folks because it takes a little more effort to get back into this area. Uh, one note about this area is the Lawrence Lake Road is currently closed because of some litter issues. Uh, so, and it's probably uh, still got uh, some snow on the trail now, so it's not quite ready for hiking anyway. Uh, but if you're thinking about this one for later in the summer and the next one, um, uh, check on that uh, road condition before you head up in this, uh, into this area. And uh, this will uh, bring us to our final hike recommendation. Uh, this is another one in the Lawrence that originates in the Lawrence Lake area on the north side of the mountain. And uh, this is the Barrett Spur at the top of the Pinnacle Ridge Trail. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. The Pinnacle Ridge Trail sucks. It's burnt, it's exposed, it's dirty, it's dusty, it's dry. Um, you have to do some root finding. You're probably gonna tromp through some mud even in the middle of summer. So you can't be mad at me if you try this one and you don't have a good time. But once you get up to the Timberline Trail and you veer off and head towards the Barrett Spur, then you start climbing into some fantastic alpine scenery. Again, 
um, because it's more challenging trail, it's more remote, not a lot of people flocking to this one. Good way to find some solitude and enjoy some really spectacular scenery. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief snapshot of day hiking Mount Hood and some recommendations for some uh, safe social distancing hiking this summer. Um, you didn't need to take, I forgot to mention, you didn't need to take any notes uh, during this thing. All of this information will be going up on dayhikinghood.com. And of course you can uh, find all this information in my new guidebook, Day Hiking Mount Hood by Mountaineers Books. So thank you everyone for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this session. I'm gonna turn it back to Marissa and our uh, special guest from Oregon Wild. Thank you, Eli. That was great. Um, all right, let's hand it over to Chandra now to hear about Oregon's ancient forests and Oregon Wild's important work in that arena. Chandra, there you are. All right, okay. it's all you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, let me reintroduce myself a little. Um, I uh, work for Oregon Wild, a um, nonprofit organization. Uh, working in Oregon since 1974. And um, as Marissa said at the beginning, our mission is to protect and restore Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters um, as an enduring legacy for future generations. Um, oh, and I realize I'm not sharing my screen. Hang on one sec. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. Um, and uh, so I've worked in our Eugene office uh, for about 16 years. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to um, write this book, Oregon's Ancient Forests. Um, so in the summer of 2017 and into 2018, and it was released last summer by, by Mountaineers Books. So it's uh, pretty wonderful that I get to um, do one of my favorite things as part of my actual job, <laughs> um, which is to hike. And, um, uh, sorry, I'm clicking. Um, so it's pretty great to hear some suggestions from Eli because I honestly haven't done nearly enough hiking around. And, uh, and some of that stuff that's up above tree line is, is stuff I don't usually get to because I'm usually dealing with forests and forests are really where um, I love to hike. Um, that's me, this is me here getting out into some of my favorite places. Um, and so I'm fortunate um, not just to be able to uh, do some hiking and write this book as part of my job, but also to um, work to protect and advocate for the forests that I love here in Oregon. And man, there are some doozies. Um, <laughs> hopefully, if you're like me, you've gotten out to enjoy some of Oregon's forests, and I hope to be able to inspire you to do even more of that. Um, but we have just some absolutely gorgeous forests and um, it feels really good to um, be able to, um, to, to, to help protect them as part of my work at Oregon Wild. Um, these forests, of course, are wonderful for going hiking, but they're also, um, uh, they're also important for so many other reasons. Um, they cool and filter the water that salmon need to survive, um, and that we depend on for drinking. They support healthy soil filled with um, all sorts of important organisms that help everything run, as well as fungi that we like to eat. Um, they store tremendous amounts of carbon and provide a climate refuge uh, as the, our world warms. And our forests provide habitat for wildlife, large and small, that can't be found anywhere else or can't live anywhere else. So, um, so these forests are important, not just for their, their amazing beauty and uh, recreation. Um, about half of, of Oregon um, was once covered with diverse forests that changed and adapted over time for millennia. Um, unfortunately, over the last century or so, humans have carved up this landscape covered with forests with roads and with clear cuts, fragmenting forest ecosystems, destroying wildlife habitat, damaging soil and water quality, um, stopping the natural role of fire, and replacing our diverse native forests with dense tree, found, tree farms um, and overgrown forests that um, once evolved with fire. 
So today we only have about 10 to 20 percent of our forests in Oregon that remain um, unlogged. So let's focus there. <laughs> those, those are the, those, those little, little bits of forests that are left. So my book is, a, is called Oregon's Ancient Forests. Um, but what does that mean exactly? I know a lot of people are more familiar with the term old growth forest, but to me, this is really too limiting and defined by age. Um, I know I don't like being defined solely by my age um, or my cat's bad behavior I see behind me. Um, so I, def I define ancient forests as ones that have grown and developed naturally over a long period of time without much human intervention. So that means they might look like, like this photo um, with uh, giant old trees, uh, a, a diversity of shrubs and small trees in the understory of different species. There's dead trees standing and down on the ground. Um, there's healthy soil and there's lots of different types of habitat for um, wildlife to, to live in. Um, these forests are incredibly diverse and they're always changing. They're very dynamic. So um, going for a hike in one of these forests is always a different experience for me or if you're paying attention. Um, there's everything from the variety of wildflowers that are growing after a fire, um, the mushrooms that pop out after a rain, um, the uh, woodpeckers drilling holes into, into um, standing dead trees, and then the mosaic and patchwork of disturbances like fire that um, play over the, um, over the landscape. Um, the diversity on a larger scale um, can be broken up into different forest types, and that's one of the things that um, that I focus on in the book is sort of defining what these types are across the state. And there are several. Um, these are defined by the types of trees that grow in a certain area. Um, and that in turn is uh, defined by things like geology, water availability, uh, terrain, uh, like mountains. Um, but there's a lot of diversity of forest types across the state. From small pockets of forest types, uh, like um, quaking aspen, um, that's the black on the map, um, to forest types that cover a good part of the state, like ponderosa pine, which is in yellow. Um, there's also on the coast that band of, of red that I call the coastal fog zone forest that's dominated by Sitka spruce, western hemlock, and down in the very far corner of um, southwest Oregon, even coastal redwoods. Um, and then you see a lot of dark green on this map, and that is our beloved and ubiquitous Douglas fir forest type um, that probably most of us um, living in Western Oregon or Washington um, are very familiar with. Um, so, so there's a lot of diversity there. Um, so where are the ancient forests? And that's one of the things that um, my book tries to, to, to do is to help people discover where these forests are, um, and um, also how they're managed because they are inexplicably linked. Um, so the short answer to where ancient forests are in Oregon is mostly on federal public lands. Our national forests, um, which are shown in green on this map, um, which is, is from the book, um, and a little bit on land managed by the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, which is in sort of a peach color on here. There are a few small areas of ancient forests and state parks and forests which show up in yellow. Um, and the reason for these uh, locations is because this is where environmental laws, public values, and forest advocates have uh, been able to shape policies that protect ancient forests. So in my book, um, again published last year by Mountaineers, I divide the state up into 14 different regions and there are 91 hikes. Um, by no means is that comprehensive of all of the ancient forest trails in Oregon, but they're, um, they're some of my favorites and they're spread out um, across the state uh, to kind of pick up all of that diversity. Um, the book has all that standard stuff like at a table in the front, um, driving directions, um, you know, things you need to know in order to get to a place. Um, but it really, uh, what makes it unique is this focus on the different forest types, the forest ecology, um, uh, the protection and management status of the forests um, that you're hiking through, as well as giving some of the advocacy context for um, whether a place is protected and um, why that might be important. 
you also get a little bit of my nature nerdiness um, <laughs> instilled in the book. Um, uh, I love exploring and learning new things about the forest that I go hiking in. And so I try to give some tips on um, what you might like to learn or think about when you're walking along the trail, um, such as, you know, figuring out what uh, plants are edible, um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, the fire history of an area, um, things that really help uh, your experience uh, be unique and help hikers have the best possible experience. So I'm going to go into a few hike highlights as well. Um, since uh, I'm piggybacking on Eli's uh, Day Hiking Mount Hood book here, uh, I'm going to start with the Mount Hood region. And I only included five hikes in this region in my book, um, even though I, Eli filled the book with, <laughs> with hikes, and I know there's lot, lots more out there too. And that's in large part because uh, when I was doing uh, the research for the book in 2017 and 2018, a lot of Mount Hood was closed um, because of the Eagle Creek fire. Um, and and uh, so I wasn't able to actually get on a lot of trails. So perhaps in a future edition, uh, I'll include other ancient forest trails um, around Mount Hood. Um, the great thing about the Mount Hood region, though, is that the forests are so diverse as you go um, in, from low to high elevation and from the west side to the east side of the mountain. Um, so a couple of the hikes that I have, and uh, by the way, the ones on this slide are ones that I would say uh, are in the don't go category that Eli uh, started with um, because they are so popular and accessible. Um, or Salmon River, which is a nice low elevation, easy and beautiful um, hike with gigantic trees. Um, and Lost Lake, uh, which has a lot of diversity. Um, it's at a fairly low elevation, um, but it has a resort and a pretty popular trail. So again, um, maybe not one to go to this summer as we uh, try to practice uh, safe social distancing. Um, as we go into some of the um, higher elevations and to the southeast and east side of Mount Hood, that's where the forests get really interesting. Um, so the three other hikes that I have in this region in my book are um, uh, the forest around Barlow Pass, and that includes uh, a hike on, um, on the Pacific Crest Trail heading north of the highway, as well as along Barlow Creek. So there's two hikes in that area that go through really spectacular um, uh, higher elevation forests. Um, 15 Mile Creek, which is on the east side um, of Mount Hood, is a is a long and difficult loop, but you go through some of the most diverse forests that you'll find anywhere in the area, um, including with big ponderosa pines like the one that's shown here. Um, and then also um, Boulder Creek and Boulder Lake is another um, little bit out of the way uh, location on the south side of Mount Hood. It has a lot of diversity. You do see some ponderosa pine and other pines mixed in with the, the alpine trees. Um, and you can go to beautiful Boulder Lake if you want an easy hike, or you can go um, along Boulder Creek for a little bit more, um, more difficulty. So a lot of variety there in the Mount Hood area. Okay, um, I'm going to take you on a, a little spin around uh, other, some of my other favorite hikes in the book that will focus on places that are um, less crowded uh, and, um, and out of the way. Um, I wanted to kind of pique your interest in these places, even though, as Eli said, the recommendation is to stay close to home and this, none of these hikes probably qualify. Now's a great time to read up on these hikes, um, start planning for when it is okay to travel further away. So I wanted to make sure that um, you got a, got a taste of some of the far-flung places across Oregon. So a couple of my favorites are in the upper Umpqua region um, in my book. One of those is um, uh, called Cripple Camp. It's in the Rogue Umpqua Divide Wilderness Area. And um, I, I recommend about a 5.8 and a 5 .8 mile um, round trip, but there's uh, other longer loop opportunities uh, from that trail that I recommend. And uh, you honestly get to see, a, again, a huge diversity of tree species, including some of the largest incense cedar and Douglas fir um, that, that I know about. So it's a pretty cool spot and um, relatively easy. Um, another one is um, Yellow Jacket Glade, which sounds scary because nobody likes yellow jackets, 
but um, it's actually separated into two words and it's not related to the, the um, vicious insect. Um, Yellow Jacket Glade is really a nice loop about five and a half miles long. It has these beautiful meadows as well as diverse forests and um, uh, there's a campground nearby, but beyond that, I don't think a whole lot of people go there. Um, if you really want to get out in the middle of nowhere, um, the Klamath Lakeview region hikes that I have in the book are, uh, will meet your criteria. This region is, um, is, is pretty far out of the way for most people who um, live in cities in Oregon, um, but there's some really spectacular places. Um, one of those is Cottonwood Meadow Lake. Um, I think whoever named it mistook uh, aspens for cottonwoods, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's really lovely. Um, there's a, a three and a half mile loop that goes around the, the lake uh, through some really beautiful forests. Um, moving out into um, the Blue Mountains and the Malheur National Forest, uh, there's some really beautiful river hikes. Um, great places to escape um, and hike through um, huge ponderosa pine and western larch forests. Um, this one is along the Malheur River, uh, the Malheur River um, Canyon Trail. Um, it's a wild and scenic river. Uh, that has some protections along its banks and is absolutely spectacular. And uh, you can do an out and back of various lengths. And then finally, um, the region that I think a lot of people don't know nearly as well uh, is what I call the Northern Blue Mountains, um, which includes um, not the Wallowas, but the area to the west of the Wallowas and a little bit to the south. Um, uh, this hike that um, features really beautiful uh, western larch, lodgepole pine, and Engelmann spruce forests, which are pretty unique, um, is in the book described as the most remote in the entire book. <laughs> so it's definitely out there um, and uh, hard to get to. Um, well, it's just it's just out. It's a long drive, um, but really spectacular, cool place to discover um, a very unique. Forest. Um, and again, it's an out and back um, that can be, you know, anywhere from uh, three to seven miles um, on a relatively flat trail. All right, so there's my, that's my very brief tour. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to um, uh, end by driving home why I feel it's so important to help people get out and experience these amazing forest hikes. So I'm going to read a short piece from the introduction of my book. Um, which, uh, which um, highlights an experience that I had about 18 years ago in the place that you're looking at in these pictures. So keep, keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so again, there's the book. Um, from a small lake on the western slope of the Cascades, where some friends and I had set up our tents beneath towering western hemlocks and red cedars the night before, we set off through the dense forest following the stream flowing from the lake. There was no trail. We were deep in the wild and in rugged country where trail building and maintenance were not prudent endeavors. And the shrubs, evergreen huckleberry, Oregon grape, devil's club, formed green walls making forward progress difficult. Climbing up on fallen logs three to five feet thick, we followed an elevated highway, our path a giant array of pickup sticks. Whenever we needed a short break from the strenuous route, we gazed upward in awe at the towering trees surrounding us. The world was draped in countless shades of green, stacked in lacy layers. Everything smelled fresh and dirty and old at the same time. Small openings in the forest stood out, washed in sunshine. Birds and squirrels flittered in the underbrush, heard but not seen. We continued for hours, taking it all in. When we stopped for lunch, damp, warm, scratched up, but reveling in the beauty and loving every second of this experience. Um, it was in a grove of some of the fattest, tallest trees I'd ever seen. It was the epitome of peace, of joy, of camaraderie with nature and each other. And while my friends perched on logs to enjoy their sandwiches, I wandered away for a vantage point, looking to capture the moment with my camera which I did in this picture that's on the left here. Using the thick bark of a giant tree, I pulled myself up onto a down log. Leaning on the giant and steadying myself for the photo, my hand hit paper. I looked, my heart dropped. It was the marker for a timber sale. 
Now, the sign I encountered that afternoon in the magnificent ancient forest grove was fortunately also ancient. The imminent threat to that grove, very real 15 years earlier, had been neutralized thanks to the persistent and adamant actions of citizens who also valued that special place. As federal land managers prepared to build a road and rev up the chainsaws in that grove, forest advocates ensured it was instead protected as the Opal Creek Wilderness. So to me, that uh, just really sums up why we not need to not only um, enjoy these forests, but also become advocates for them. Um, for um, We needed them in the past, we need them now, and we're gonna need them in the future as well. So um, that's uh, one of the, the key takeaways from my book, and I hope that you'll explore it and learn to love these forests um, and want to protect them as much as I do. So with that, I will, um, I will end, and I think we'll go to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chandra. That was great. And thank you to Eli. Um, we are going to go to questions now. So if you have any questions for either Eli or Chandra, go ahead and enter them into that Q&A box now. All right, let's see what we've got here. Okay, is the Sandy River Bridge still out on, on the Ramona hike? I am assuming this is for you, Eli. Yes, it is still out, and uh, the Forest Service has no intention of replacing it, unfortunately. The, uh, the river channel in that area is just too dynamic, and they can't, get, uh, they can't get a firm footing for a bridge in that area. So it's going to stay uh, wild and unbridged the way it is for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. So be prepared to uh, ford that if you head out there in that area. Um, and be careful if you go too early because it can be a pretty dicey crossing. All right. What does lollipop mean on the Barrett slide under distance? <laughs> uh, lollipop is a reference to a trail shape that looks like a lollipop. You head out one direction, you start a loop, return to where you came from, and then you head back to your trailhead. So, um, You've got out and back hikes, which are usually there and back. You've got loop hikes, and then a lollipop is out, do a loop, and then come back. Great. All right, and another one for you, Eli. Um, what's the best trail for Hayu Mountain? For Hayu Mountain, that's actually on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, that's just the geographic feature that the trail tra uh, contours around as it heads northward from the Lolo Pass area on its way through the, um, the Bull Run watershed. I noticed somebody asked um, about, does it actually climb Hayu Mountain, which is in the Bull Run watershed and is thus uh, off limits for um, exploration. Um, you have to stick to the trail when you're hiking through that area. The PCT is a permissible corridor. Um, so you don't actually summit Hayu Mountain, you just contour around its uh, slopes. Um, there's some great viewpoints along the way, so um, not to be missed. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and then for both of you, um, if there is one hike you'd recommend for someone visiting, if you have family coming from out of town to Oregon, who's not used to hiking but can do easier hikes, what, which one hike would you pick? <laughs> Chandra, you want to go first? <laughs> I mean, it really depends on, on where you are and um, uh, or you want to drive, I guess. Um, I mean, so I'm in Eugene, so maybe you can answer this question, you know, living in Portland, Eli. Um, so for me, I would, I mean, I, I like, I like impressing people with big trees because from other parts of the country, um, you just, you just don't get what we have. Um, so I'm going to say, uh, perhaps the Pond Grove. It's a hike in my book that, again, not, not a ton of people know about, but it's um, it's uh, near the town of Florence in the, on the coast. But um, so if it's a you know good thing to, to check out on your way to the coast um, when we when we're allowed to go there again. Um, short and it's very impressive. Eli, this one's tough if we're thinking about social distancing this summer because. Um, all the hikes that are easily accessible and less strenuous are also exceptionally crowded. Um, 
one that immediately pops into mind is Mirror Lake, but um, you might as well go to Disneyland if you're going to hike that this summer. Um, uh, gosh, as far as remote hikes go that are not strenuous and enjoyable, um, I might recommend hiking a portion of the East Fork Hood River over on the east side of the mountain. There's a couple of different trailheads that you can get to that. Um, the terrain is pretty nice. There's, it's a nice combination of east and west side forest. So you get an interesting combination of trees and flowers over there. Um, you get some of those big Douglas firs and hemlocks as well as ponderosa pines, which is a really cool combination. Um, and uh, you're uh, kind of traipsing uh, just up and above the river there. So you get some nice views. Um, gosh, another one for avoiding crowds that's not too difficult. Um, I would say maybe uh, try a portion of the lower Sandy River also. Um, this is, um, you can access it from the Ramona Falls trailhead, but instead of heading for Ramona Falls, you go the opposite direction and you walk along the river. Um, it's mostly flat. It's uh, some dry lodgepole forest, um, but there's some interesting mosses and rocks through there because it's a, uh, it's an avalanche zone. So it's a little bit different than the normal Mount Hood terrain that you get, but there's some river and mountain views that make it nice. It's a good way to get out and uh, take an easy stroll um, without going too far or um, having to do too much work. Thank you. All right, uh, how well marked should we expect various trailheads to be? Trailheads are all really well marked for the most part, as long as they're open. Um, uh, there are, are there are a few trailheads that are gated. Um, most of them are accessible either off of the main highways that go around Mount Hood or uh, via forest service or old logging roads. Um, they're pretty obvious um, and um, usually very well signed. So you're you're hard pressed to um, go anywhere that's that's not at least decently marked. Everything in my book. Day Hiking Mount Hood is a very well-marked and established trailhead area. So you'll find uh, start signs, you'll find parking areas. Um, some of them will have facilities, but you probably shouldn't expect those to be open anytime soon. All right, a couple questions about mosquitoes. Um, if we're looking to avoid mosquitoes, are there specific trails that we should specifically avoid? Or do you generally have any tips for- uh, All of them. Mosquitoes? <laughs> at least until July. Yeah, it's really about timing. Um, you know, knowing, knowing that at higher elevations, you know, after the snow melts is when they're the worst. So um, if you're above 5,000 feet um, and it's before the middle of August, I wouldn't go. <laughs> risky, risky business. All right, and this one is for you, Chandra. Um, does your book help with tree identification? Um, it helps with it in that I, I um, point out what trees are along the trail um, as, as you're hiking along, but it doesn't actually have a key um, or anything like that. I do have resources in the back of the book um, for some of my, you know, recommendations for um, uh, uh, guides that you could look into to learn trees. Um, there's also a great app um, called PNW Trees that's uh, great if you don't want to carry a book with you. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Definitely some helpful resources in there. Um, speaking of, we have a question of what's the best resources to check for which trails are open? Um, the Probably the best resource for Mount Hood is to go straight to the Mount Hood National Forest website. Um, there was a link for it. Uh, that was mentioned in uh, my closing slide. That will be up on uh, dayhikinghood.com. Um, but if you click on recreation and hiking, and uh, it gives you the option to look at day hiking trails and backpacking trails. Um, and Mount Hood is usually one of the better forest sites that keeps that information updated. So um, yeah, for all your status information up to date, um, you can visit that. Um, and you can always call uh, one of the regional district offices too, and they can give you information. 
All right. And Chandra, do you ever lead group hikes or is that not part of your job description? Someone wants to go on a hike with you. Yeah, um, it actually is part of my job description. And um, in a typical year, I would lead about one hike every month. Um, we are not um, leading group hikes this year. Um, we may reassess that in the fall, um, depending on how the summer goes with, um, with COVID, but, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be back up and running next spring. And other Oregon Wild uh, staff members also lead hikes. Great, um, okay. So this is a question I'll actually take. Is there a package deal to buy both books if you want to pick up a copy of both Eli and Chandra's books? Um, there is not a package deal, but if you go to our website, mountaineersbooks.org, we have a 20% a 25% off deal on all of our books, including Eli's and Chandra's. So you can get both of them for 25% off on our website using the promo code time to read because we all have a lot more of that these days. Um, so definitely head over there and pick up a copy of both books. And another question, what type of wildlife would one encounter on the more remote trails? Squirrels. I take, I guess, squirrels. <laughs> Honestly, you know, in, in hiking all over the state, I saw surprisingly little wildlife and I was alone, which um, usually is when you see more wildlife, but they're, they're wily, they know you're there. Um, I was really hoping to see a wolf um, because I was hiking in a lot of, of Oregon's wolf country in Eastern Oregon, but I didn't. Um, I did see a moose. Moose are pretty rare in Oregon. They only live in the, the northeast corner of the state and there's only a few dozen of them. Uh, so I think being in a really rem remote area helped with that and that was pretty cool. Yeah, ditto that. Um, one of my favorite wildlife stories to tell is the uh, three summers that I spent hiking up and down the PCT here in Oregon for my PCT guidebook. Um, uh, in all three of those summers on the Pacific Crest Trail, thousand miles of hiking, I saw two deer and one bunny rabbit and one pile of bear scat. Um, the critters are out there, but um, they don't wanna have anything to do with us. Um, that being said though, um, I still like to suggest that um, you be aware that they're out there. Um, I'm sure some of you may have heard there was a cougar attack on Mount Hood um, a couple years ago, unfortunately, the first recorded cougar attack in Oregon. Um, it was such an oddball thing to happen. I mean, the, the odds of it happening again are just astronomical. So you don't need to go out there and be fearful of wildlife, but just by practicing good trail ethic and and knowing how to respond in the odd chance that you do happen across a wild animal is a good way to stay safe. Um, because yeah. um, for the most part, animals don't want anything to do with humans. They're not on, we're not on their menu. So you don't have to be fearful in that sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm, your book might have this as, as well, Eli, but I definitely have a section about, you know, what to do when you encounter wildlife. Yeah. And um, I, I saw more, more bear scat than I wanted to see. <laughs> but I, I didn't encounter any bears. <laughs> I love seeing bears. I only see bears when I go down to the Sierras in California. All right. Well, I think that's about all of the questions we have time for, but don't worry if we didn't get to your question, um, we'll have Eli and Chandra write up answers and send them around um, along with uh, a recording of the video within the next couple of days. Um, so thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Um, again, I want to reiterate that on our website, mountaineersbooks.org, you can use the promo code time to read for 25% off all of our books, including Eli and Chandra's. Um, and don't worry, we will include that promo code um, in with the email with uh, Chandra and Eli's responses to the rest of your questions and a recording of this video in a couple of days. Um, as a reminder, Mountaineers Books is a 501c3 mission-driven nonprofit. We are supported by a combination of book sales and philanthropic support, which has become ever more important in this uncertain time. So please consider purchasing a book or making a donation to help us continue publishing our award-winning books about the outdoors. And tune in on June 10th for more from Eli and Oregon Wild, who will be discussing the campaign to protect Mount Hood through incre increased wilderness designations for the forests surrounding the mountain. And you can find all the details on that at OregonWild.org. 
In the meantime, we hope you are staying safe and finding ways to enjoy all that the outdoors has to offer during this time. And we hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>